I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Josh Goldstein. Josh is a postdoctoral fellow in economics and conservation finance at Stanford University. Uh, Josh earned his PhD from the Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources in June. For his dissertation research, he addressed the question of how to pay for conservation here in Hawaii, focusing on the perspective of private landowners and groups investing in conservation. For example, he explored business strategies for coa forestry because of its potential for a win-win outcome, profit for landowners, and capacity to supply habitat for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Josh is going to present to us today on new ways to pay for ecosystem services and biodiversity in Hawaii. Thank you. A key challenge in making conservation mainstream is addressing this question that's really simple to state, but complex in trying to answer. Uh, this question being how to pay for conservation. And earlier we heard from David Brand about the investor's perspective, a, a group that's looking at investing in conservation to seek return. And I want to look at a complementary perspective here, that of private landowners, many of whom are depending in part or in full upon their land to support their livelihood. And across Hawaii and really throughout the world, we have an increasing recognition of the importance of private lands in supporting biodiversity and ecosystem services. And interestingly, uh, private lands have been in the discussion for quite some time now. If we look back at the thoughts of Aldo Leopold, one of the great environmental thinkers of the 20th century, back in 1934, he wrote uh, an essay called Conservation Economics. And he wrote the following. He said, the thing to be prevented is destructive private land use of any and all kinds. The thing to be encouraged is the use of private land in such a way as to combine the public and private interest to the greatest degree possible. And Leopold continued, this paper forecasts that conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. And it pleads that our jurists and economists anticipate the need for workable vehicles to carry that reward. So I see as our challenge uh, exactly what Leopold says. How do we develop these workable vehicles? Certainly this applies to private and public lands in Hawaii. How do we create the opportunities where landowners can invest in conservation? And how do we do it across the very diverse biophysical, economic, cultural and institutional contexts uh, that occur in Hawaii and throughout the globe. So I want to focus on this question in, in this talk. What are the opportunities uh, to create business models for conservation on private lands? How do we align the incentives? And I want to come back again to this uh, notion that has been advanced by several people. And it's to think of ecosystems as capital assets, assets which, if we manage appropriately, can provide a stream of benefits to support well-being into the future. And let's take, you know, as an example of forest, uh, an uh, example I'll carry throughout this talk. And, you know, traditionally when we think of a forest, we think probably first and foremost of its timber value. We may also be able to get some uh, revenue from grazing cattle in the understory. These are probably the traditional commodities that we would think of. However, we all know that there are a much wider array of benefits that come from this forest, supporting a habitat for biodiversity, climate stabilization, uh, hydrologic services, which Kate just spoke on. While these have historically not had economic value associated with them, we're in actually an exciting time where there are mechanisms emerging which can create opportunities to capture value through um, these services. And for example, conservation banks are emerging, uh, particularly in the United States, here, these are ways, an incentive uh, to restore or maintain habitat for biodiversity. These are particularly emerging in the context of endangered species. Uh, we also see a class of um, broad payments for forest cover, uh, such as a program that emerged in Costa Rica in 1997, paying for a suite of services provided by forest. 
And so with that framework in the background, let's think about this question at hand of how to create these business models and address the needs of landowners. And in thinking about this question, we need to sort of be open with the fact there's a real range and diversity of landowner types and flavors. And if we're going to be successful in our efforts, we need to make sure that we're able to address the needs of everything from a very small landowner, one who basically supports their entire livelihood from their land, all the way to a very different end where we have a very large institutional investor who is managing for a large number of beneficiaries for current and future generations. So what are the, some, some of the factors we would want to think about here in Hawaii? First of all, there are a range of land uses on, um, across Hawaii. The pictures here on the right uh, show a land use gradient from Malka lands on Hawaii Island, the area where I've been working for the past couple years. We see a range from open pasture through to woodlands, through to intact forest. And many of these lands are working lands, lands on which economic activity is occurring today and is an important source of income for the landowners. So we see a really key challenge in advancing uh, this broad vision to capture biodiversity and ecosystem services is finding ways to integrate conservation with production. Similarly, landowners have very diverse economic situations. And one key issue here is what is the requirement for return to sort of tip the balance towards investing in conservation? For some, again, we may need just a small payment, a small portion of cost offset. That may be sufficient for landowners to be happy to internalize the remaining costs and advance um, conservation practices. That's one end. On another end, we may find um, more of a traditional investor, someone for whom a real competitive true rate of return is going to be needed from the land. So how do we address these diverse situations? And finally, there are diverse motivations for um, engaging in conservation. Many landowners are driven by a strong ethic of doing what they feel is right on the land and to leave a legacy on the land. How do we create the right opportunities for these landowners? And also, how do we acknowledge that many want to continue um, engaging in some form of uh, traditional production? For the ranchers that we work with on Hawaii Island, many would like to see some continued connection to their cultural um, legacy in ranching. Again, so how do we integrate conservation and production and align incentives? So let's dive into this question. And to think about this, I want to uh, talk through a general approach, a very business-like approach, where you think of stacking multiple revenue streams, that is, multiple sources of income that are derived from the conservation activities on the land. And we're all very familiar with the cost side of the equation. We know they're large, and we know that they pose a formal, formidable financial barrier in Hawaii to investing in conservation. We've heard a lot already today about this, the high cost of fencing, of invasive control. We could keep listing them, and we know that these costs are high. And the question is, you know, if we have this analogy of sort of a scale, and we're thinking about how to tip the balance in favor of conservation investments, what's on the other side, which can start to balance out the costs and provide return for the landowner? So in thinking about this, we first want to tap into existing revenue streams. And a really important opportunity here are the wide array of government assistance programs. These create a really critical foundation for landowners. And often they're uh, in sort of uh, two types. One is where they provide cost share assistance. So say 50% or 75% of costs offset um, for putting a fence, for uh, controlling invasives. On the other end, we have programs which provide payments on top of cost share, also rental payments. So annual payments for essentially renting the land for conservation. And for those interested, there's a really excellent compilation of these that Katie Friday, Sherry Mann, and Steve Smith put together and can be accessed on the web. So with government programs, we can start to tip the scale. For some, this will be sufficient. For others, though, additional revenue streams will need to be added on top. Easements, conservation easements, are a tool that is uh, increasing in use in Hawaii and really exploding throughout the United States. So if we think of property, uh, owning property as having a bundle of rights. Easements are simply taking a few of those rights and donating them in return for being compensated. Often it's donating development rights uh, from the parcel, but uh, maintaining ownership over the land. Easements provide a way for landowners to capture some of the value of their land uh, as it pertains to conservation. So between these two, we can start to find perhaps some more landowners who would be willing to invest. Uh, thinking about the model of working lands, we can also think about ways to have working forests. 
lands that still provide some revenue from selective timber and limited cattle grazing in the understory. So this suite of existing revenue streams, certainly not comprehensive, does provide um, opportunities. What we've been talking about here is this new class, this opportunity to look at new payments for ecosystem services, for water, for carbon, for the wider range of services, things which traditionally, again, have not had economic value, but for which there are um, opportunities emerging throughout the world. And opportunities, can we catalyze these um, opportunities here in Hawaii? So simply, we can think of these as um, payments where users or people who benefit from ecosystem services pay those who supply these services from their land management. So we have a direct link between beneficiaries and suppliers. We've heard about many examples in the earlier talks, uh, including this one, the Fondo del Agua, or the water fund in Quito, Ecuador, where a municipal water, a municipal water supply, electricity company, and a beer bottler are all putting money into an endowment fund. And this fund is used to then provide money to landowners who are upstream of Quito's um, a couple million person population and manage that upstream watershed in ways that will ensure a clean water supply in the future. So again, we're connecting people who benefit from clean water with those who can help supply it. So this is sort of the framework that we have, this idea of trying to find ways to connect management and conservation outcomes with revenue streams. And I want to illustrate it with a specific example, uh, which was referenced earlier today, and that of coa forestry an opportunity that you know, has a potential to align ecological, economic, cultural, and uh, opportunities here in Hawaii. And specifically, some work I have done has looked at um, business strategies for taking a pasture, say, four or five, 5,000 feet elevation, and restoring koa forest on that land. And it's a suite of revenue streams that we can draw on uh, in the model that we're talking about here. The timber, carbon credits, and cattle in the understory, also, the bottom two, which are government programs, the Forest Stewardship Program and the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, a program that is in the process of being launched in Hawaii um, as we speak. So what are the ways to combine these to create investment opportunities for landowners to achieve conservation? Here's a result, um, a graph with the results, where on the x-axis are different strategies um, for um, combining those revenue streams. The y-axis is the net present value of the investment simply one number that aggregates all the different costs and revenue. And basically, if it's above zero, it has a positive return. Below, it's negative. So there's a lot going on here, and I just want to highlight a couple of points um, for our discussion. First, if we were to look at the opportunity cost of continuing in cattle, for some landowners, in fact, we're going to be able to generate a higher return through COA by combining revenue streams. The most attractive opportunity is this conservation reserve enhancement program with the traditional uh, timber opportunity. Uh, interestingly, under the incentives and market conditions that I looked at two years ago, carbon on its own was not a viable investment, just the one service. However, if we couple that with the government program, again, we have a way to stack revenue streams to take this model to create a way to tip the balance in favor of conservation. So this is the question we have. Can we start to find ways to catalyze opportunities for ecosystem services in Hawaii to achieve where people who have forests are supplying services out and there's revenue coming back into those lands to pay for the management and enhancement of forest or other types of land? A key challenge here is linking conservation buyers and sellers. And we've spent most of our time talking about the seller or the landowner side, the high cost of conservation, the need to integrate conservation with production, and the fact that the income from these lands is very important to the landowner and the different types of landowners. Equally important is the buyer side, the beneficiaries of these services. They have very diverse motivations. Some are engaging in voluntary purchases, um, as David Brand had talked about earlier. Others are regulatory driven. They span a very wide range, airlines, things connected with the tourism industry, electric utility companies. and. We need to think about where the opportunities are in Hawaii to target buyers and to link them with landowners providing these services. And key to this is the credibility of the transaction. And thinking about how are we going to measure, monitor, and verify the conservation credits coming from the land. And we have wonderful technologies being advanced here with remote sensing, on the ground measurements, really state of the art work, which is gonna help us get accurate, credible, um, cost effective protocols for measuring and monitoring. 
So we asked the question, what opportunities exist for creating uh, these business models? And we have to realize that making conservation profitable, profitable remains a real challenge. It's going to take sincere uh, uh, thinking and investment to think about how to overcome the barriers. This approach of stacking revenue streams can be one way to create opportunities for landowners, and ecosystem service payments are likely to be an important part of this. And we need to think about how to link buyers and sellers to really catalyze these opportunities in step. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> Hakalala ke kia manu ika ohu, ika ohi ahamau. Meho ohamau ita leo kale huapane, apane mai pahai ke ia mamue.